two methane and LOX fuel high bypass turbo ramjet engines are housed under each wing. Uh, I'm going to sk skip to the next slide because I'm running behind. See, you have to buy the book to read what I skipped. <laughs> the SR-75 and the uh, daughtership SR-74 were built by Lockheed Advanced <laughs> Development <coughs> Company, which everybody knows is Skunk Works. And uh, the SR-74 daughtership is called the Scramp. It's kind of cute, huh? But it stands for Scramjet and Rocket Propulsion. The Scramjet is a supersonic combustion ramjet. Uh, Gerald and one other source uh, witnessed the first flight of the SR-75 with the SR-74 piggyback out of Area 51 before my friend Glenn Campbell moved in up there and scared them all off. <laughs> it was the sitting piggyback the SR-75, and he said, uh, I guess it was back as early as 1975 that uh, he knew that they were developing uh, the SR-75, which is pretty incredible. I guess it took them uh, 12 or 13 years to get this thing flying right. So it must be some pretty good technology. The uh, SR-74 can't take off from the ground. It has to be on top of the SR-75 above 100,000 feet altitude. Then it can attain orbital altitudes. The Scramp launches ferret satellites for the National Security Agency that weigh 2,000 pounds <coughs> or less and measure 6 feet by 5 feet. But as you can imagine, the, the old satellites that were big as a van, you can pretty much now make one about the size of a briefcase, so you don't need booster rockets. Na the NASA space shuttle, I'm here to tell you, is really an antique by comparison. The joke is on us. If you think these rumors are far-fetched, look at the YB-49 and the XB-70 flown in 1948 and 1964, respectively. Now look at the SR-75, which has been spotted numerous times. You say the government can't keep a secret? Boy, you're wrong. There's new rumors from my sources that two new orbited, <clears throat> two new vehicles have been placed in permanent orbit. One of these vehicles is the Space Orbital Nuclear Service Intercept Vehicle, Sun Civ. When you hear it from another reliable source in 10 years, you'll remember this. It's codenamed Locus. The SR-74 and the TR-3B flying triangle can deliver spares, replacement units, service fuels, chemicals, and modules to the Sun Civ, our locus. The robotic Sun Civ uses deliverables to service, calibrate, repair, and replace parts on the newer NSA, CIA, and NRO ferret satellites. And I know for a fact that they were developing a robotic repair of electronics equipment as far back is 81 because I worked a program to where they didn't want technicians looking at the equipment. Remember, I was in the forefront of automatic test equipment when they didn't even have a computer to run to automate anything with. Finally, I've saved the best for last. The operational model of the TR-3B. Uh, a friend of mine said he had never forget the sight of the alien-looking TR-3B landing at Papoose, south of Groom. The pitch black triangular-shaped TR-3B is rarely mentioned, and then only in whispers. Next slide. <clears throat> the original TR-3B is, was 200 feet across the prototype. It was codenamed Astra, and I was just informed by Jeff Rentz when I did his radio show that Astra has, has connections all the way back uh, to the Indian flying vehicles several thousand years ago, which is interesting, they codenamed it Astra. The tactical reconnaissance TR-3B first flight was in the early 90s. The triangular-shaped, nuclear-powered aerospace platform was developed under the Top Secret Aurora program. 
by 1994, there were three billion dollar plus operational models. These are this, the operation model is 600 feet across. This fine triangle is not fiction. If you don't believe me, ask the tens of thousands of people who have now spotted one version or another of it from Belgium to England. Ken can tell you about people that have seen it in England to Arizona. The TR-3B vehicle's outer coating is reactive to electrical radar stimulation and can change reflectiveness, radar absorptiveness, and color. The polymer skin, when used in conjunction with electronic countermeasures and ECCM, can make the vehicle look like a small aircraft, flying cylinder, or even trick radar receivers into falsely detecting a variety of aircraft, an aircraft in another location, multiple aircraft, or no aircraft at all. The circular plasma field accelerator ring, called a magnetic field disruptor, surrounds a rotatable crew compartment. It's far ahead of anything you've ever imagined as far as technology. Sandia and Livermore Laboratories developed a reverse engineered MFD, and I believe the government will go at any lengths to protect this technology. But you're not going to be able to build one of these from what I tell you, nor am I. So the government will go to any lengths. Believe me, the plasma in this accelerator is mercury based. It's pressurized at 250,000 atmospheres at a temperature 150 degrees Kelvin, superconductivity and accelerated to 60,000 revolutions per minute to create a superconductive plasma with a resulting gravity energy. The MFD generates a magnetic vortex field which disrupts and neutralizes the effects of gravity on mass within proximity by 89%. Do not misunderstand, this is not anti-gravity. Anti-gravity you can use as a propulsive force. The mass of the circular accelerator and all the mass within the accelerator, such as the crew compartment, avionics, MFD systems, fuels, environmental systems, and nuclear reactor are reduced by 89%. This causes the effect to make an aircraft extremely light and able to outperform any aircraft yet constructed, except of course those we didn't build. Uh, <laughs> TR-3B is a high-altitude stealth reconnaissance platform with indefinite loiter time. Once you get it up there at speed, it doesn't take much propulsion, propulsion to maintain altitude. With the vehicle's mass reduced by 89%, the vehicle can travel at Mach 9 vertically or horizontally. So for those that have had sightings of things making right and they're not perfect right turns, obviously. Nothing can make a perfect right turn. It's against the laws of physics. But it sure looks like a right turn at a distance. For those that have seen it, that's how they do it. The TR-3B is, uh, uses three multi-mode thrusters mounted on each corner of the triangular platform. I was going to go into liquid and hydrogen, oxygen, rocket engines, and all that. Next slide, but uh, I'm not going to have any time here. The multimode propulsion system can operate in the atmosphere with thrust provided by the nuclear reactor, and in the upper atmosphere with hydrogen propulsion, and in orbit with combined hydrogen and oxygen propulsion. The original picture of the TR-3B was taken with a digital camera that was carried on a <clears throat> Special Operation C-130 out of Herbert Field. It was flying mission support for the TR-3B. Uh, the current picture, by the way, that was developed uh, with 3D Studio from that digital picture hangs in the black vault at uh, Lockheed. That's all I can tell you about that. <laughs> Minimum of four. Uh, next slide. That uh, is a C-130, by the way, that he was flying. Many sightings of UFOs are not alien vehicles, but top secret TR-3B, uh, other Aurora vehicles. Next slide. That was the original digital picture. Next slide. I do have 25 minutes? Okay, I'm stick skipping a lot of stuff. Um, Really? 
Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of confusion, like the Aurora program being an aircraft. There's also a lot of confusion. I had this discussion with a pilot that was telling me that a TR-3B had to look like a TR-3A. That used to be the case, by the way. The TR-3B was modified, the TR-3 was a concept vehicle, was modified to the TR-3A, which looks like a flat jelly bean, bat wing shaped vehicle. Uh, I believe Bill Sweetman in a, the Aurora book pictured it. But the TR-3B has nothing in common with the TR-3A. That doesn't look anything like what Bill uh, Sweetman pictured. And then there's a tier two, three, and four. There's also a tier three C. And then there's tier three minuses and tier three pluses. And every one of these are distinctly different vehicles. And the government has done this. It's their shell game with nomenclature. So if you see a tr 3 a and you see a tr 3 b and you start comparing, you didn't see the same thing. And if you have heard from somebody a nomenclature and you're comparing, yeah, yeah, that sounds like the tr you mean your tr then it doesn't match up. Sneaky, aren't they? Before Gerald died, we had a long conversation. He was sure he had documentation that could prove the existence of reverse engineering of alien technology. Uh, we talked about a lot of things, but I don't know. I've published just almost everything that was given to me or passed on to me. Uh, I don't know what else he knew. He was obsessed with quasi-crystals, and I'm not going to get into that because I'm not a physicist and I don't understand that. I also believe that Colonel Corso, you like that picture? Yeah. Uh, whoever can really f figure out what it really is, uh, I'll buy you a Coke. You ever seen a convertible aircraft? No. Leave, it, leave it there for a second. Can everybody see that? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to just leave it here just for a second. I'm deviating from our program here. I received the MJ-12 documents from Dale, who I mentioned earlier, as one of my five closest friends for over 20 years. In fact, Dale and I knew each other from our first trip to Vietnam in 69. His father now, has been, before he retired, put in 30 years, almost 30 years with the NSA, and transferred over as a military officer. When uh, I sent Dale a copy of the manuscript before I even got to, shortly before Brad Steiger got involved with the project, uh, he read as did all my friends that were still around that gave me input, read a draft to make sure that I hadn't misquoted them or I hadn't given out any information they were uncomfortable with or they felt they could be identified with. So Dale was reading the manuscript and his dad and him were very close. Uh, said, I'm going to give you some documents. And he says, they're blackened out. And he says, but I want you to retype them and where there's black, blacked out, just leave spaces. Dale's father is the one that passed on the MJ-12 documents to me. Okay, next slide. And we're going to get into this here. Uh, that's just a cool picture. I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> that's supposed to be a wormhole in the TR-3B. And I tried to visualize what they were doing with these quasi-crystals, and that's, that's my visualization. Okay, next. For the remaining time I have, I'm going to discuss the uh, MJ-12 documents I received. There uh, has already been a lot of controversy over this, and I'm just barely going to be able to scratch probably what 2% of what's in the book. And I'm going to let y'all, any of the interested, read this while I take questions and answers. But I'll tell you this, when, a couple things when we get through them. This was, these documents I received, and by the way, I've, re I've copyrighted every do government document I've got my hands on or information, because I want the government to come for us and say, we have a copyright to that. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, think, I hope they do. Okay, now, um, can, uh, can y'all read that? No. Well, it's going to shorten my question and answer, but I'm going to read a couple things to you. The presidential order signed in 1987. Uh, previous slide, back up just one real quick. The most fascinating things to me was, one, it's an unnumbered order, which, by the way, is not uncommon. It's, this is not the only unnumbered presidential order there's ever been. You can find that out for the research. And secondly, it's authorized by proxy. That's scary. It's like, 